back to the PFC podcast. The views and opinions you are about to hear are the speakers and do not necessarily reflect those of anyone else. Now on to the podcast. Welcome back to the PFC podcast. This is Dennis and today I'm with uh, Brandon and we're going to go over a difficult airway scenario. How are you doing, Brandon? How you doing, all right? How you doing, Dennis? I'm doing just fine. Um, so if you could, uh, one, just do a quick introduction of yourself, and then we can just head into kind of setting up the scenario. All right. Uh, my name's Brandon. I'm an 18 Delta uh, in the Special Forces Group. Um, so this was a mass cow scenario, uh, scenario but in real life. Um, we had a partner force getting IED with a personal carrier, and it flipped and caught on fire. Um, initially, there was two KIA right away, and then there was eight patients. Um, it's hard to get really any good information. Anybody's worked with the partner force uh, knows that. Um, so I had some hours, and I asked the medevac bird to forward the page up with me so that we could war game what uh, we were going to do. Um, my concern was that even though after a couple hours, the people that were going to live were probably going to live is that the second they got on a helicopter or moved around that they might have a clot or something else going on that would cause them to uh, expire while they were in the aircraft. So they four staged. Um, a number of hours later, uh, the auto patients came in. There was seven. Uh, one died en route. He was situated on a tiny back in the vehicle. No one could get around to check on him. And um, we had set up a large triage area outside. Um, we kind of split everybody off. Uh, I had kind of war games what injuries I expected to see. Um, being that the vehicle was hit with ice, I didn't get caught fire. Um, and then everybody from the team kind of split and started working on people. Um, they brought me the worst patient. Um, and I kind of stayed there, and I asked one of the flight medics to stand with me so that he knew what was going on the entire time. Um, when I got in, um, I did a quick cursory check. I didn't do a full march because he'd already been living for a number of hours. Um, but I checked his airway, and then I kept pointing to his eyes. Uh, his eyes kind of didn't want to open, um, even with my fingers. So I held him open, and his left eye was rotated around, I mean, far back uh, in his head. So I was kind of poking him, I was looking inside of his head, trying to get his attention, um, and it kind of came back around, and it was fixed and starting to dilate pretty well. Um, it was kind of hectic because I had two partner force patients. We squint. Um, trauma has not been a big thing for them, so they're kind of freaking out. Um, I'm trying to get them to back off. So um, I listened as best I could. There was a lot of noise, probably 100 partner force soldiers uh, in the general area, all their friends. Um, and I could tell that he was breathing. So now he was protecting his airway, but he had Christmas. I mean, his mouth maybe was open a half inch at the teeth, and I couldn't budge him any further. Um, his vitals, initially, his heart rate um, was around 105, and his BP was hanging at 99. So, I mean, I know he has a head injury, so, like, you know, we had salt, which is for liver stains, because we were out of liver stains with that many people, patients. Um, and we threw a bunch of MRE boxes under the head to get him up as high as possible. I went super high without dumping them off the uh, litter. Um, we got IV access started, and we threw the Tempest on him um, to uh, try to figure out, you know, what else is going on. BP was worrying me, so um, I was trying to find out where that was coming from. Um, it was feeling around his abdomen, was soft and non-tender. I could see he wasn't reacting to any pain there. There was no extreme, like I said, you know, um, turns out that he was, you know, a partner force soldier and they've been out for five days and 
um, not a lot of water. So he was just extremely dehydrated on top of the head injury. Um, so as far as the other treatments, I just run down real quick. I mean, the, the all the normal stuff, the fullest, um, 23.4% hypertonic in him. Um, I held up on pain medication because I wanted to try to track his mental status. So it was fluctuating. He actually couldn't, um, uh, five and eight around there. Um, I could get one of his buddies to talk to him and he would kind of be a little more alert. Um, and then he would just go back. So, um, at that point, um, I'm looking at it and we got to get ready to guys, um, uh, on the bird. He's the worst out of everybody. Although there was uh, a bunch of other surgical patients. And I was thinking to myself, do I need to take his airway because of the Christmas? Um, and so I decided to bag him. Um, it's just a skill we could do with a, a mask. Um, and it was pretty painful. So, um, surgery was 30 minutes away, um, from, by, uh, helicopter. And so I, I got out of credit kit and I found my landmark. I had the surgery and I stopped and kind of paused and I said, do I need to, do I need to take his airway right now? So I kind of warned him, what does this look like? You know, the flight medic, he's aware of what's going on. He's been staying watching the whole time. He helped me out. Um, and surgery's 30 minutes away. I don't have RSI drugs. And so I'm thinking to myself, if he made it this long, he can make it 30 more minutes and they can RSI him and not have another um, in my mind, insult um, to his throat. So um, I ended up not taking it. Um, we got um, all of them on the bird, and he was the first one out, and they got him to um, DCS, did the x-ray, um, and then got him to a local neurosurgeon, and he actually um, – made a full recovery. Um, he definitely had uh, a subarachnoid, um, but uh, they were able to stave it off. Um, and I think being that he survived as long as he did before he got to me, it's hard to say whether the treatments really did it or if he was going to survive either way. When all, all that happened, you know, we did a lot of ARs, and I spent a lot of time between then and now thinking about particularly him in, in the entire uh, situation in general, but particularly him, you know, what could I have done differently? What should I have done? And the thing that kept coming back is that I should have taken the airway um, because his GCS is low. We know that people with ICP um, vomit pretty often um, and that they don't have a really good way of controlling where that vomit goes. Um, so being that I put seven people on that helicopter, seven patients, the flight medics don't speak the local language and that he has this head injury. If he would have aspirated, just them getting around to doing about it, catching it and, or anybody even making them aware that that happened because they don't speak the language it would have been catastrophic. Um, Turns out on x-ray, um, once he stabilized, there was evidence that he had already aspirated prior to even coming to me. So um, if he would have vomited, it you know, would have been probably life-threatening for him. Um, when I could have simply done a crack, not hard, um, and then that would have been covered. And even if he vomited, it would have been a big deal. So, um, like I said, I spent a lot of time thinking about that. And I think it's worth discussing because, like we were just talking about earlier, uh, a lot of people, they run through scenarios, whether it's at the schoolhouse or somewhere else. And these situations where we're going to take an airway, we're going to crank. 
they are so clear cut. Like, oh, yeah, he's got a facial with burns, or he's got a facial lack, or he's got something where it's like, no, it's this is this is the only way, you know. And um, I'm not saying that innovation is the way to go, but since we took those out of the airway, uh, CPG, I think that there's this whole idea of being cavalier with it without really understanding what are the consequences and then what are the indications really? I mean, we always say, oh, GCS less than eight, but what if there's no other outside injuries? Is it that easy for you to make that decision? Um, and I think that really changed the way I view things where that line is, that decision line, where it's like, okay, this needs to happen because if something turns south, especially I'm not there to do anything about it, you know, this guy's going to die. Right. Or possibly die. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I see that pretty frequently. Um, you know, everybody knows, you know, the book answer, the, the indications to do that. Um, but when it comes time to do it, even if it's um, most of the indications are there, then guys uh, guys hesitate or um, they will do the airway or take the airway with the crike even when it's not really indicated um, and, there, and there are other options. So I think guys need to just think for themselves as far as, you know, what what is the situation or what am I willing to tolerate um, before I take the airway? And if it crosses the situation, crosses that line, then you just act. No, I, I completely agree. And I think um, even before that happened, um, if he didn't have Christmas, I've gone to use an eye gel. I know when I was first in, you know, Sockham and all that, you know, go through EMT and, you know, you get the King LT. Um, and the, even the progression of my time in Sockham, you know, those devices, you know, they're just made fun of and, um, you know, you're like, I don't really, I'm not going to use that. Um. And so, generally, as far as airway, most people have it through a pee plan at this point. Oh, I, I can crack them. You know, and a lot of times that is going to be the best option because most people can't RSI. It takes a lot of drugs to keep someone down if you treat them um, or use an extraglottic. Um, but I carry an IGEL, uh, both myself and the other medic on the team, um, as an extra option. And I think it's worth saying that, you know, having another option at your disposal. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, when, when you're ever talking about airway and, uh, you know, what is their, uh, I guess, airway of choice or, you know, kind of what's their pace plan, it's crike. Okay, what's your alternate? More crike. Um, you know, then we're just, you know, just more crike. That's all they have. That's really all they have. Um, you know, you ask them what tube size they have, you know, seven, seven and a half, eight. Um, and a lot of these things won't even fit through the, the cricothyroid membrane. Oh, but especially for, you know, what your average partner for is, guy looks like he's not, you know, an American who's been fed well his entire life, you know, it's 220 pounds and six foot one. You know, it's, it's not going to fit. Right. So they, you know, I could see... I can see. I can definitely see having it, one advanced airway technique that you practice over and over and over, and you've mastered it, and you're at least familiar with others. Um, I think we definitely we need to have one advanced airway technique that's going to secure the airway with a with a balloon. So whether it be crike or intubate, I don't really care which one. Um, one's going to be more re resources intensive than the other, but that's fine. Shooter's choice. Um, but you also need to have extraglottic options as well. But I also think, um, you know, we, that's why I went to the course, the digital airway course. There's a trend, in, I think, in, especially in our community, where these basic items like an OPA, you know, oh, that's stupid. I'm not going to use it. Well, you know, I'm sitting in the digital airway course, and you, know, you have some of the most prominent doctors as far as airway in the country and they're saying, I put it in an OPA every time, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, 
And so I started putting one in my bag. It's like, well, it's just another tool because sometimes it's just positioning, you know. Maybe I don't have to cut a hole in his throat. Right. You know, maybe I don't have to even give him drugs enough to keep him down uh, for uh, a tube, at least for now. You right. know, especially in that situation. Yeah, I was hurting for time to try to get these guys as stable as possible um, because a lot of my fractures, I was worried about that. Day. There was a lot of tumor fractures all from my medullaries, what have you. Um, I, I didn't have a lot of time. So, um, stop gaps, you know, a lot of people have gone away from these stop gaps, at least in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, OPAs, I rarely ever see anybody putting or talking about putting an OPA in. And I, I guess I kind of understand like, uh, you know, you're going to stimulate that gag reflex, um, so they either position if they do if they bother doing that, um, NPAs, uh, and then crike. That's pretty much it. Absolutely, and I think um, you know we took innovations out uh, when we redid the airway CPG because just people don't get the amount of time, and then it's resource intensive. Of course, the amount of drugs. You know, I was talking to a guy the other day, and he was degree, and he was like, hey. I'll just bring more drugs. I'm like, okay, well, you let me know how that works out for you. You know, right. like you've ever ordered from Metball. You know, a lot of times you get half of what you ask for. Oh, yeah. Yep. You know? Um, and, and even in that scenario, I used so much ketamine and fentanyl with, with all those guys. You know, it was insane. Right. You know, it goes quick. Yeah. It definitely, um, everything goes much faster than you thought it would. So, but uh, yeah, again, if you only have one way, you know, what are you going to do when that doesn't work? Right. No, you know? or crack. That's what you do. Exactly. And what if you mess that first crack up to where that area is not even useful anymore? You yeah. know, whatever, your hand slipped and you did an egregious cut. You know, right. what are you going to trade them now? Yeah. Oh, well, that's what everybody says. Um, but yeah. does anybody train to do it? No. No, and then you watch them try to do it for the first time, and then they transect. Yeah. Um, um, but uh, I guess, so I've never been to that course, a uh, difficult airway course. I guess, what is the what is the context of the training that they're giving you? Is this hospital-based? Is it, what is it? So it, it's both. So paramedics and, and above go. So it, generally it's um, physicians and paramedics. Um, there was a couple nurses, um, and then there's a separate uh, course that goes concurrently for uh, anesthesiologists and CRNAs. But it's basically a place for doctors will go there, especially to refresh their skills, um, to find out what is the latest and greatest, what's the newest stuff. It's kind of like just like any stock and qualified medic goes back to stock and uh, a seat, a office, I should say. Um, so, you know, you walk through kind of the first day in the morning, some basics, and then you start doing these kind of labs. You have dummies, you have, you know, scenarios, stuff like that. But I think the algorithm is really what sets the course apart and really simplifies it um, for you. And, and it kind of starts with here's your basic stuff. You know, is this a crash airway? Did this guy just cover it or? You know, he's, his pulse is gone. You know, at okay. that point, you know what you have to do. I mean, right. if it's yeah. us, it's going to be a crike. Um, maybe an extra, uh, uh, I'm sorry, it would be a crike for us. But the thing that they were talking about is just what I was mentioning is use that extra clock as a stop gap, right? Right. The heart, the heart beating isn't, I mean, we're going to do CPR if that's the case, you know, if we're not in the combat zone, but what he needs is oxygen. Right. Off of that, that CO2. So the only way that the person's really going to survive is if we can keep that saturation high. Yeah. Um, and they spend a lot of time talking about that, that when you try to, um, especially innovate somebody at, at 86%, the curve, especially if you missed the first time, of him trending down into the 50s and 40s of uh, percent oxygen. It is high. I mean, it just crashed. 
Right. Um, and then their survivability goes way down at that point, even if you're successful in renovation. Right. Um, so if it's not a crash airway, you know, then you go into, is this a difficult airway? You know, and for them, it's, you know, um, is it difficult because of anatomic reasons or difficult because of physiological reasons? Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> what are we looking at? Are we looking at, you know, some of these obese. We're looking at the trauma um, to the face. You know, what is it about it if it's anatomical, um, you know, and if anybody's been through the surgical block, you know, the Mount Potty, look at those kind of things. Um, or is it physiological because he's hypotensive for whatever reason that is. Um, the oxygen saturations are low. He's septic. Um, whatever those reasons are, um, because that's going to guide how you do things, you know. Right. Um, yeah, you have because to. the physiological is, is really what is going to be the challenge, because you need to try to fix some of that before um, you do some of a lot of the advanced airway techniques. Right, especially if you're going to RSI. One, 100%. Um, and then, I mean, and then that, that is the beauty part about the crisis. Because you're not going to make somebody um, transiently hypertensive and put them uh, into a coat. Uh-huh. Um, but they stress the same thing that we're talking about nowadays. If he's hypertensive because he's uh, been bleeding, you know, we need to get blood on board. Um, and, and that's where we some of those stop gaps, you know, uh-huh. to, to keep that airway and keep the oxygen going. Right. Um, and then, uh, you know, it's not. It's feasible for us, you know, we're talking about flush rate flow oxygen and going, you know, at 60 liters a minute. Right. On, on an on rebreather. But um, from there, it, is this emergent or do I have time? Uh-huh. And uh, even for the physicians, you know, that emergent says, you know, okay, we need to put an extra glottic in, give us time to set up real fast. And then we're going for it. Um, and if it's emergent, they're even only saying three attempts by an experienced provider. So that would be, you know, the um, most experienced doctor around. And after three, he's getting an, emer- uh, uh, an emergency airway, and that's the correct. Okay. Um, and the other one, you know, if you have time, you're going to try to fix the efficiencies, get the oxygenation up, and then uh, and then go for it. Right. Um, I think that simplified things a lot for me. Um, and the way I see the airway, you know, I talked to one of the guys there. Um, he was one half of uh, the Broswell tape, you know, invented that. And I talked to him about this guy with ICT, and I was talking about what I kind of thought, and he was like, yep, no doubt. He's like, go big or go home with the airway. I was taking that airway all day. Yeah. You know, and kind of went through the same reasons that I talked about. Um, you know, it worked out for that guy, but it could have been catastrophic, you know. Right. Yep. You know, and I think when when they talk about airways, guys, also they just think about the oxygenation portion, which the, the ventilatory management type things, which is definitely a big part of it, but they're, they're not necessarily um, considering like the actual securing of the airway. And like you're saying, he could have aspirated, you know, having a, a cuff tube uh, in the airway that would have at least, uh, if not prevented, at least hindered um, any of that aspiration. Yeah, and I think really, you know, being brutally honest with myself, like I know that, uh, it, it, I, well, especially that I knew that a crack is a life-saving, um, and, and for him, you know, potentially life-saving intervention. But at the same time, there's that part of me that was looking at like, I'm still doing harm. I'm cutting a hole in him. He's 30 minutes to surgery. He survived this long, you know, and, and I had all these things in my mind where I thought that, you know, my decision was right. Um, and, I, and I think looking long and hard at it, you know, it's like, well, sometimes, you know, where they used to always say the operator feels up pain. Sometimes you, know, you got to do a little bit of damage to do a lot of good. Right. Uh, and I think that really 
bringing that thought to the forefront of my mind and looking like honestly looking at it and I really was considering that as sort of doing a little bit of damage. Um, and that was part of my justification. Well, we'll just hold off. Right. You know? Yeah. No, I definitely, uh, I definitely understand that. And I, I never want to be, uh, somebody Monday morning quarterback, somebody else. Um, like you obviously had six other patients you had to deal with. Um, so well, I can definitely sympathize with, uh, like the, the very little amount of, uh, uh, mental headspace you had left for just this one decision. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. so I, uh, don't nobody, uh, ever really questioned the, the medic on the ground, you know, he, the decisions were made, uh, hopefully in the patient's best benefit. I mean, I think what you're trying to say is they're like, just, yeah, no, people don't want to, you know, Monday morning quarterback, but at the same time, if we're not willing to talk about where are our shortcomings, where are our deficiencies, you know, what could I have done better? You know, maybe somebody's in the same situation next year or something similar. And they're like, Hey, you know what? I was thinking like he was, um, and they make the right decision. And this time it saves somebody. You know what I mean? Right. And I mean, <clears throat> somebody, especially a head trauma, if he has both an oxygenation issue and a hypotension issue, man, he is not, uh, he's not long for this world. Um, so I would have definitely put him in a, in a lower category, but, uh, you know, for that particular patient, there, those are the two, two, the two areas that you, you can't screw up. Um, so I think, I think you're right in your kind of reflections that he definitely could have used one. Um, and then, you know, make sure it's, uh, secured really well and at least protect them from that, uh, aspiration and travel of flight and then worry about, the, the lower blood pressure. Exactly. So, um, you know, and it, the pressure was on because the flight was trying to leave by the time I got the airway, because I was trying to, like I said, find out that he had an internal bleeding and that's why his BP was so low. And then bounce around to all these other patients while the rest of my team was working on them. And then get back to them. Um, yeah, there wasn't a lot of headspace. And, uh, you know, but looking at, like you said, you know, the other thing, when he got the surgery, it took two rounds of rock to get his jaw to unlock. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing. Like, had he aspirated and the medics caught it, it would have been really hard to suction that out of him, you know? Right. Uh, with, with that amount of space with his, his Christmas. Yep. Um, so every every indication was really pointing towards it. Um, and I just, I didn't make the right call. Yeah. I mean, and that, that inevitably happens with anybody, I think. If you have any experience or length of time playing this game, you're going to make a, a bad decision at some point. You know, but I think that... Uh, you know, I, I, I've talked about this with a lot of people. The, the legend of the soccer medic um, has grown so much over however many years that people are afraid to talk about, you know, what did I do wrong? You know, uh -huh. What could I have done better? And openly talk about it. You know, it's easy to talk about it behind, you know, the doors of your team room or with your battalion surgeon, you know, in his office. But, you know, let's talk about it as an open. Let's make it a dialogue. Let's have a discussion. You know yeah yeah absolutely absolutely um so i guess now that you've been through this course if you were able to go back um i guess what would you have changed other than i would have taken his airway i guess how would you have taken it you know set up the, okay. the whole thing so i think in the end because it's hard the only reason I stayed on the ground is I was afraid, like I said, the vibrations of the helicopter, everything else, the movement out of their trucks to me, that a clot was going to break or there was something, it was insidious happening, and I wanted to make sure they were suited best to get on that helicopter. Um, also knowing that the roll two was only going to be able to really handle one surgical patient at a time. So I wanted to make sure that they had the best chance of survival and then get them the hell out of there. Um, but I, even though like now, um, you know, uh, I'm, 
like I'd be okay to carry rock and accommodate. It would have taken more time to bolus uh, saline or LR on them then wait the 60 seconds for rock and accommodate to really work then tube them then if i miss i, I think in the end i would have cracked them again um that's where we diverged a little bit from the definitive airway course because or the difficult airway course sorry um because of the nature of where we work and the amount of support we have yeah definitely um, but I, I, I am going to carry rock and accommodate. Uh, it's very few and far between patients I would ever use it on. I have personally never come across one in real life where I, where I think back on if I had rock and accommodate, I would use it and innervate them. Um, but I think it's worth stating, I think I have not talked to a single medic that I'm aware of that has even picked up that um, the hypercurve blade uh from the kit from the transport kit oh yeah you know because we've gone away and i think it's worth saying okay we need to try to be as good as, on as many skills um as we can um and at least every now and then just pick it up just be familiar with it um because you may find yourself in a situation where that's the right answer right so if you're if you're adding uh intubation to your kit I guess in a real way. I guess what are you, um, what are you doing to make sure you're trained up on on intubating and the process? So I try to do MPTs more often um, than the ones every four years. Uh, I try to sneak a MPT in um, after every deployment. Okay. So um, and so getting to a hospital, getting out there to the OR. Just trying to get some more looks um, because, you know, we talked about this the other day. The dummies don't really give you um, that great of a, a real feel. Uh -huh. You know, there's not a bunch of emesis and saliva and foreign bodies and, uh, in there. Um, and they're always in the perfect position. Right. Um, and I think it's worth noting that, again, that, that innovation is for the rare. Uh, in my mind, the best candidate is the 55-year-old contractor who has been sick for five days, has said nothing, and then somebody brings him to and he's got COVID or malaria because you know, the contracting company doesn't um, – you know, buy malarone. Uh -huh. uh, they buy, you know, something cheaper or the doxy bottom that they're giving them. And so now he's being he's altered, uh, but I have time. You know, right. um, that would be probably the, the person I think about. Um, and if I did an innovation, it would be in my aid station. I'm not doing them out. You know, yeah. Um, it, the, the resource required as far as keeping out drugs. And then the last thing I want to talk about, and I think you really brought me into thinking I was already doing it a little bit, uh, was what are we doing with these drugs and that this fallacy that standard somewhere in the community where morphine and fentanyl are no notice for anybody with uh, you know, respiratory issues. Um, and, you know, and so we only talk about using ketamine. Um, but how do we keep this guy down if we got him for 24 hours? Because you're probably going to run out of cutting. Right. Yeah. You know, so I think that's another discussion, but uh, I think it, it ties in is why don't we just modify the dose? And, yeah, exactly. You know, um, you know, this last year I've, I've gotten a lot of opportunity to use uh, different vents uh, and, uh, and actually push drugs for vent management. I tell you what, uh, going to an opioid has definitely uh, up my game as far as vent management. Because uh, I, I consider myself a, a moderately intelligent person, and trying to get those vents to work uh, while using ketamine, um, I was banging my head against a wall because um, it would. I was constantly having to fight. Um, but 
now starting to add, you know, fentanyl and now morphine or hydromorphone. Any of those opioids, uh, things have gotten so much easier. Yeah, no, it really, it really does change things quite a bit, um, in my opinion. And, I, you know, for pain control, people, the guys that have, you know, bilateral femur fractures and fracture pelvises, um, you know, I give them ketamine for a, a 30 minute ride. Unless I just really go hard, that's going to wear off. And yeah. now the flight medics jumping around trying to redose everybody. You know, I did fentanyl on these guys before they rolled because uh, it's going to last. Right. Yeah. Um, but, you know, way past the flight time. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely like, uh, you know, respiratory reasons, uh, abdominal injuries, things like that. I've definitely gotten a lot better uh, success using opioids uh, than just ketamine. Uh, I think guys are, I will not say they're comfortable pushing ketamine. I guess they're definitely way more comfortable than pushing an, an opioid. I'm surprised that anybody's been alive since we've been using opioids for, I don't know, a few thousand years. Yeah. Um, but uh, somehow, somehow we've made it. Um, but that's another thing. Guys just have to get comfortable using the drugs that they carry. As simple as that. And Absolutely. it's up to them and it's up to their uh, docs to make sure that they get the experience. And the schools. And the schools themselves, yeah. when they're training guys, they, they have to get people experience pushing a drug to see what happens. You really do. And I think it's ironic that you literally see People fill out the narc request form, and they just go down the line of what normally is ordered. And so they carry, you know, ten vials of morphine and five vials of fentanyl in the country. And then you ask them, like, uh, "Would you use it?" Oh no! Like, well, why'd you even bring it? Right. Right. What was the point? Yeah. Um, you know, like I mean, when I first got to the team, nobody give me was there to give me any advice on like how much to bring. So I didn't even know how frequently you would get resupplied. So I was like, um, I think I need, you know, a pallet of, uh, you know, morphine. Um, Cause I'm thinking, you know, nine months worth of combat, you're, <laughs> I'm gonna go through it, you know? Um, yeah. So uh, there's just, there's just a lot of not talking, I guess, as far as this is how you do it. This is how much you need. Um, this is how you use planning uh, to kind of uh, customize what you actually need uh, so you can make better choices and not carry, you know, entire pharmacies worth of uh, medications around. Exactly. And I think uh, today's environment, you know, especially when it comes to airway and everything that comes with managing an airway, um, a, a definitive airway, that the environment that we find ourselves in without, you know, a golden hour um, is, makes it that much more important. Yeah. You know, because some of the places, you know, that I've planned for and some places I've been, it's, it's a long time. Yeah. You know, some of the places in Africa, you know, you're not going to see U.S. becoming with care for days. Right. Besides the rule one. Right. And um, they're not necessarily more, much more equipped than you are. Yeah. And then you're not getting a, uh, you're not getting a resupply. Right. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another quick question on airwave, at least from your experience and from this course, uh, how important was suction? The suction was really big. You know, um, I carry a switch in my head. I mean, that's the best I can really fit in there. You know, it's uh -huh. not the best thing. We all know that. But I think that the tendency is for somebody, for, for the community at large, as soon as somebody says, oh, it's not that great, they go, oh, it sucks, I'm never using it. Right. And it's like, well, I think you took a little too far. Right. You know, having something in, in that situation is better than nothing. Right. So do you um, do the uh, the 20 cc with the IV tubing, 20 or 30 yeah. cc? Yeah, that's, that's in my bag. If it's not great, um, but it, it, it does work. Um, and, and I use, you have to use positioning in conjunction for it to really be effective. So okay. let's let it drain out by gravity. Um, then you can land back on their, on their back. Um, 
and then use the suction at the same time. Uh, I don't find that the squid uh, is very effective in helping you if you're about to crack, you know, uh, after people talk about having suction available just because of the bloody mess mm-hmm. um, that, that can be there. I don't really find that having that suction around, I think that uh, uh, piece of gauze or a shirt sleeve um, is going to be more effective at clearing that blood out of the way temporarily enough for you to see what's going on there. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But it's it's incredibly important. I mean, if you can't see in this in that particular um, portion of medicine and airway management, then you, you can't really do anything. Right. Right. You know, and you know, you could potentially be taking you know good lungs and fouling them with either the blood, saliva, or vomit, um, just because you're not suctioning that out. Absolutely. Um, and then, uh, you know, the, the nice thing about the reason why extraclotic wise I carry the eye gel as a suction port in in the device. So I can run the suction down it um, and kind of clear it out because it's not a definitive airway and it's not guaranteed to keep all aspiration or saliva from going into the airway. Right. Um, does a whistle tip fit down that? I've been having a hard time uh, getting something to fit down that. The the IV tube goes goes down it okay. um, from from the squid, okay. um, but the, the, your your mechanical suction um, is not is not going to uh, make it for the most part unless you modify it. So I took ours and then put the drip chamber the same way you put the squid over the uh, suction um, line, mm-hmm. and then just ran a lot of tape. Okay. Yep. And just had it set that way. And I didn't have that on the suction. I had it next to the suction. I had a regular uh, line with the anchor uh, on the suction in my clinic. Okay. All right. Cool. Um, is there anything else you'd like to uh, talk about? No, I think I think we pretty much covered it all. Um, you know, again, I think it's important for for people to you know honestly admit. Um, when things could have been better, um, and then it, it kind of contributes to the community as a whole in that way. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, thank you. Uh, thank you for coming on and uh, sharing. Yeah, no, I appreciate you having me on. Um, give me the opportunity to kind of talk about that. Yeah. All right. Have a good one. How you do? That's it for today's podcast. Be sure to go to our website, www.prolongfieldcare.org. Find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. Subscribe and stay on the bleeding edge of combat medicine. This is Dennis for the PFC Podcast. Our boy is waiting there for you.